So, <coughs> can we swap projectors, Carl? Great. Okay, so uh, it is time for our first after lunch talk. Our uh, presenter is an organizer at Pi Lady Chicago, a director of the Python Software Foundation and a recent uh, hire at GitHub. Uh, she tweets. She tweets at uh, Lorena Nicole. I have not spelt. I don't know how many O's in that. You'll remind everyone. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, four, four O's. So it's Lorena Nicole. Okay, cool. Uh, please welcome Lorena Mesa. Can y'all hear me okay? Awesome. Okay, so I hope when you looked at the schedule, you're like, there's words on here that aren't in English. If so, you're in the right place. So <laughs> the name of this talk is affectionately titled Esquincala Babosa, creating a telenovela script with a neural network. Uh, by the way, if you want the slides, they are linked there. And I will also tweet these out after the fact, because I imagine you might not want to be playing with all the devices at once. Uh, additionally, as was mentioned, I'm on Twitter and do all the things. So after this, if you want to talk a little bit more about the topic or give me feedback or anything like that, I would love to do that in person with you, because that's the way I like to rock and roll. So that being said, I really, really do think deep learning is pretty interesting. And I'm a deep learning noob. So for me, I always like to try to find something interesting to kind of tinker with. And that is very much the, the inspiration behind this talk. Also, I really, really, really love telenovelas. So win-win, I think so. <laughs> And on that, on that front, uh, as was mentioned, I do do a fair amount of work around the community, uh, Python Software Foundation. If you do have any questions about that, uh, Chris and I are both directors. We can talk to you about that. Um, GitHub, specifically, I just joined the Software Intelligence Systems team. So we're building out the infrastructure for machine learning to happen. So if you like deep learning, which is something that is very much a part of the vision going forward for the Software Intelligence Data Org, please come talk to me. There is hiring happening, and I would love to kind of talk to you about what I've seen thus far in my time at GitHub. But yeah, that's some stuff that I do. So all of that being said, I've, I've been really, really interested in kind of looking at the intersection of art and AI, or art and deep learning, or however you kind of want to frame, frame those spaces. So I think many of us may have seen something like this, uh, which that's literally that, I think that explains it very beautifully. But in 20, 2017, I saw this article in Ars Technica and was utterly fascinated. So the, the, the bit behind this, essentially, uh, Ross Goodwin, who is a creative technologist in Google's Artists and Machine Learning program, basically does a lot of really interesting things that are right at the intersection of art and machine learning. Uh, he actually describes himself as a person who employs machine learning, natural language processing, other computational tools to help realize new forms and interfaces for written language. So he's always trying to make examples to help us think about the spoken word when applied with computational models. How does that change? How do things stay the same? Um, and so what this kind of article got into, and rather, I'm not going to play the video, but you should definitely go check it out. It's really bizarre. Um, essentially, what, what is happening under the hood here is using, uh, using RNNs and uh, uh, using an, uh, a series of RNNs, uh, uh, recurring neural networks, thank you. Uh, essentially, the model was able to be trained all off of David Hasselhoff's speaking roles, including, yes, Baywatch. And it generated some really, really, some really interesting lines that he then dropped into a short, kind of inspirational, artistic, quirky five-minute short. So that being said, I, this was really the first time I started seeing kind of text generation being applied to the idea of film and to the idea of video, visual kind of presentations. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, leading into this, and I apologize if that's a little grainy, but all of my slides do have links back to these things. So March 2017, this is now March 2018, and I was just getting more and more fascinated because I was like, okay, what's happening on Twitter around all this stuff? So essentially this dialogue captures a, a Twitter debate, I want to call it, where someone said, I made a bot. I trained this bot to watch Saw for like 10,000 hours. Side note, no one should ever do that to themselves. That sounds terrible. But essentially, essentially this person saying, hey, and then 
having trained it on watching Saw 10, for 10,000 hours, I then made a script. And the, under, uh, the underlying part is I tried as best as I could to filter out noise and kind of focus on some of the dialogue that happened there. Uh, one of the people said, well, hey, actually, are you really, are you really using deep learning to generate these scripts? Because you'll notice uh, in reading the script, there's, move, there's terms like Trump and whale that pop up. And there was a call out saying, actually, neither of those words appear in the Saw script. So what are you actually doing? And all this to be said, that I think that there's a lot of people who are starting to kind of play with these techniques. But there's a lot of, like anything with machine learning, like anything with, with deep, now, now deep learning, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of myth, a lot of fantasy. And that's kind of what I wanted to explore. It's like, what is actually practical? Uh, what can't we do? What can we do? And what is stuff that we can today maybe start pushing a little bit more the, the envelope on? So then back to like why telenovelas? Uh, I wish I could just be like, because they're great, and then walk off the stage, but that would be silly. <laughs> actually, actually, with, with, uh, with telenovelas, if you ever do like, an internet search and you find this topic, uh, this, this meme specifically, Esquinca la babosa, it comes from this telenovela. And yes, that is a BuzzFeed article that goes through like frame by frame, like deconstructing this really, really ridiculous over the top telenovela scene. Um, and when I was thinking kind of about these projects that are happening with Saw, happening with David Hasselhoff and Baywatch and all this. It really just, I was like, okay, well, you know, those are really kind of, those kind of projects are very well defined. When we think of Saw and we think of horror, there's things you can define that are very obvious about the tropes that are employed in that. Same can be said about some of the, some of the categories of, of daytime sitcom television programming that David Hasselhoff has been in. And it actually kind of made me think of telenovelas. So as a, as a little bit of a backdrop, first of all, what Esquinca la Babosa means, more or less, is essentially you stupid, stupid, spoiled, entitled brat. Because <laughs> essentially what's happening here in uh, Maria La del Barrio is the, the woman here to, is playing a stepmother, and she walks in, and her name is Soraya, and she walks in, and she sees her stepdaughter being kissed by her ex-husband's child, and she's still in love with her ex-husband, so she thought that it would be problematic if her stepdaughter and her ex-husband's son became intimately involved. And then what proceeds is like the most over-the-top dramatic kind of fight. As you can see, there's screaming, there's tears, there's like really big slaps um, where you can like visually see that no one's actually getting slapped and people are like falling on the floor. But, but all of that to be said that, that telenovela has a flair for the dramatic. <laughs> um, so, in kind of pushing this a little bit, a little bit deeper, uh, Jorge Gonzalez, who did a, who in 2003 published "Understanding Tol Telenovelas as a Cultural Front," he basically described telenovelas as this: the social phenomena of televised melodramas, called telenovelas in Spanish are serial melodramas. Thank you. <laughs> but essentially, he goes in to kind of say that the, 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 the power in these narratives is essentially how the story builds a very personal relationship with the viewer. And it's that relationship with the audience that becomes the part where you're sitting on the edge of your seat and you're so, so curious what's going to happen next. Um, to put it also into more perspective about how popular telenovelas are, uh, by the way, telenovela translates quite literally to televised novela story. So you may think, okay, soap operas, I will challenge you and say they're not the same, but they're similar. <laughs> uh, but in th thinking about kind of the global phenomena of telenovelas, uh, this is from a 2006 publication in, uh, in uh, article in Telegraph, where it was summarized that approximately 2 billion people watch telenovelas, which is about a third of the global population. Um, that means that people in more than 100 countries are watching telenovelas. Some $800 million, $800 million a year is invested in making telenovelas. And if you need to bring it home even more, if you look at Mexico, where my family hails from, uh, there was more than three hours of telenovelas produced alone in 2012 at a total of $250 million, which, to put in parity, is about the cost you would have for making a film like Titanic. So it's interesting, these forms of, these forms of entertainment that have pop up, but really, this is a global kind of phenomena. It is something that a lot of people partake in, and so I was like, let's keep going. 
Uh, then also the, the, the thing here uh, that I want to keep driving home is when we think of telenovela, el dramal es real. Everything is very real. So telenovelas, I thought, might be an interesting thing to kind of break down because they have very distinct characteristics. So Dr. Diana Ross, an associate professor of communications at the University of Connecticut, um, when interviewed by PBS, basically said, one of the things that is really interesting about telenovelas is the familial kind of relationship and the social structures that, that are built around telenovelas. Uh, she goes on to say, things have to be cleaned up so the audience has satisfaction. They don't want to worry about Maria. Did she find true love, her true mother, or her true father? Telenovelas always have a conflict kind of like that, but they are very much something that comes with a bow at the end. So back to how I said it, it is not like English soap operas. I have no idea who in here has ever watched an English soap opera. If so, raise your hand. Okay, yes, we have some people in here. So I, I remember like 20 years ago, one, like the, uh, as the world turns, and I think it's still on. I don't know. Needless to say, English soap operas keep going and going, which is fundamentally different than telenovelas. So if we were to think a little bit about the, start, the arc of a, of a telenovela, um, we have that, the notion of a fixed melodramatic melodramatic plot line, the most common being something like love lost, mother and daughters fighting, because that's real, uh, long lost relatives, love found. Um, you have a finite inning, uh, beginning and end, and you always have some conclusion that wraps up everything with a nice bow, for example. There's a really big wedding at the end. If anyone watched Casas de las Flores, which is on Netflix, I would love to talk to you about how you feel that ending of that was. <laughs> but, but these are kind of the tropes that are used a lot in telenovelas. So when we think about um, telenovelas, if we were looking at Spanish telenovelas, so La, Re La Reina del Sur, so that's with actress Kate del Castillo, who many of you might know her because she went to meet El Chapo with Sean Penn, and that was the write-up that was in Rolling Stone. So she has been in, she's been an actress in telenovelas for a very long time, and is probably one of the best names known when people talk about telenovelas. So this uh, La Reina del Sur is essentially how her character, Teresa Mendoza, who's a young woman in Mexico, becomes the most powerful drug trafficker in southern Spain. So that's that story which is interesting because then she went to go meet El Chapo, so interesting questions. Um, but this is, this is one from 2011, and then another example we have is Yo Soy Betty La Fe, which is actually from Colombia in 1999. Um, actually has had over 17 adaptations into other countries with their own kind of varying twist on the plot line. So the, that being said, I did actually kind of cheat a little bit, and I went to latina.com, and I was like, what, are you, what, what, is, what is everyone saying is their fav favorite telenovelas? So again, kind of the melodrama we have, we have violence, we have as you can kind of see the vi like the visual kind of perspective of it, there's like a lot around consuming beauty or not being beautiful, quite literally, as we see in the title with uh, Yo Soy Betty La Fea. But the, the thing here, and because we're talking here in English, I did not want to actually focus on uh, telenovelas that are in Spanish. I, instead, I wanted to look and see what crossovers actually informed English uh, telenovelas. And there is actually a Wikipedia page for that. It, in <laughs> Spanish te telenovelas crossover into English, so fun fact. Um, so the ones that I decided to look at include Queen of the South, which is basically the English adaptation of La Reina del Sur. Uh, then we have Ugly Betty, which I'm sure many of us are aware of what that one is. And then also Jane the Virgin, Jane the Virgin actually being a new one, which I thought was interesting. But um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that trope, basically the idea is uh, she's a virgin, but somehow magically becomes um, pregnant. And it's discovered under strange circumstances that she uh, is impregnated by her OBGYN with the sperm of her boss. So it's a very over the top, it, it's a very over the top story. So again, all of these have like really magical kind of components that are really pushing reality, right? So we've talked a little bit about telenovelas. We understand that there's trips involved. You're like, Lorena, you said you would talk about neural networks, maybe text generation. What is going on? Are we gonna do trivia of telenovelas all day? I could do that, but we won't. <laughs> Uh, so that being said, um, when, we, when we talk, I always like to frame a little bit language, particularly because the kind of machine learning that I come from um, actually comes from the more traditional kind of sense. So when we think of machine learning, you may think of the term that Arthur Samuel, who actually coined the term machine learning in 1959, 
uh, put forward, which is a field of study that gives computers the abilities to learn without being explicitly programmed. So if we're not explicitly programming them, what in the world does that mean in the language of machine learning? Uh, I, thought, I thought that this is a very nice overview. By the way, all of my sources are linked. So please, this is not my graphic that I made, but these are all linked. Uh, so if you're thinking about machine learning and we're saying y y that you don't have to explicitly program something when we talk about machine learning, that can mean a lot of things. So I'm going to focus here on the bottom right, learning subfields. We have supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, reinforcement, deep learning. I'm not going to go into all those. We only have half an hour. But be cognizant that when I say neural networks, which is part of deep learning, that this is a subfield of machine learning and, there, and that when it comes to deep learning, we can say deep learning is supervised or is unsupervised. It kind of depends on how you set up the problem. But all that to say when we're talking about explicitly not having to program something, and that's machine learning, understand that there's a bigger world than just what I'm talking about here. So the uh, the way that I always let then like to think about it, because the way that we were kind of the way that I've kind of always thought about machine learning is from the supervised kind of space. So thank you, Tom Mitchell, who in 1997 came up with this kind of language, which I always fall back to when I'm reading too much math when it comes to ML. Basically, machine learning when we when we say machine learning, we say a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and some performance measurement P if its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience E. So so machine learning, we're going to have some tasks that we want to automate. We're going to provide it some way to, to do the automation so that it understands what automation is. And then we're going to have some benchmark to understand how well we're doing, some kind of compass, some kind of understanding, right? So the the kind of evolution of how we've all thought of this, and I, and it does get a little uh, when we, when we see neural networks and we see deep learning, a lot of people uh, will use like AI interchangeable with deep learning. And actually, I'm going to push back a little bit on that and actually say, if you think about the philosophical origin of where these terms come from, artifi artificial intelligence is supposed to meant to have parity, like a one-to-one -one mapping of human intelligence with with whatever is the thing that is artificially intelligent. Um, as you'll notice, that that's kind of space and time, 50s, 60s jargon. We then get into machine learning. And it's wild when you think about some of these algorithms like being around from the 70s. <laughs> but then you, you get into machine learning, which many of us probably are familiar with more the, the idea of supervised learning, like training a spam classifier. Um, but then when we, what's kind of considered like bleeding edge right now is now this notion of deep, of the deep neural network, deep learning. So in the evolution of all that, the, again, kind of the thing here to focus on is you can think of these as separate subsets of, of machine learning or somehow informed by one another. So for deep learning, you can see that if we're saying machine learning algorithms improve their performance when, ex when exposed to more data over time, deep learning is kind of twisting that a little on, it, on its head to say, hey, we're actually going to have to start with a, a boatload of data actually more than boatloads of data, but, but, but still, you're going to have to throw a lot, a lot of data at it. And you're going to be using this thing called uh, the neural network, or what we will see in a moment is the kind of unit that powers that learning. So if I were to just t think about a deep learning a kind of problem, if I was thinking about classification, so classification, the idea that you maybe are looking at, back to the email example, if you're looking at a piece of email and you say this is spam, yes or no, you're providing it some data to say, hey, given maybe the words in this email, uh, the words can make a word frequency if you're doing naive Bayes, and then that can compute a probability score to say, hey, yes or no, which one of those two is higher? That could be a classification problem if we're talking about it as a supervised problem. Uh, if we're thinking about now going a little bit more into the world of deep learning and we're thinking about classification, let's say that we have a flashlight that we want to be able to program to say, hey, if I say the word dark, like you need to click on. So like, what would that actually mean? What would that look like? Well, a deep learning implementation can learn basically things like the word dark. It can learn other relevant other relevant phrases such as I can't see or the light switch won't work. So the idea here is your, your, machine learning pr your machine learning model here is actually able to, with its own activation function and its brain, start to infer things and grow its knowledge of expertise beyond the, the initial things you may have kind of pointed out and understood to be an indicator of whatever the thing it is you're classifying. So the neural network versus deep learning, you can have uh, when you have deep learning, you're actually going to have a subset of neural networks. So if you ever see that, just I got confused by that by that distinction. But deep learning is then we start using 
a variety of, of neural networks together, and this is where we start getting into how deep learning does its thing. So unlike with maybe our supervised example that I was saying where you would maybe have, if you think of that Excel spreadsheet where you have columns where that explain the features of your problem, here we will still have inputs, um, but really what's kind of driving the learning here is the, the idea of the neuron, which is meant to be which is meant to be based on this idea of the biological neuron. So the, our neuron model kind of simplified is like this. You have, you have your inputs. The inputs then have an associated weight. They then pass through this activation function, and this activation function basically starts optimizing the weights to understand the, map, to understand the patterns underlying the data set that you're providing in. And through many epochs of training, you start optimizing these weights such that you can, let's say, do classification or do text generation. So our idea here of the activation function is kind of the thing that provides the learning, and the unit of learning we can say is the neuron. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, uh, how quickly you want something to learn, you can actually pick different activation functions to do this. Uh, depending on how aggressive or what you, what you may want to do, you have different options available to you. But right here, back, pro pro back propagation. So when we, when, we, when we enter the world of deep learning, there are many types of architecture for your neural networks. So for example, you can have the recurl neural network, which propagates data backwards and forwards um, from later processing stages to earlier processing, processing stages. It's basically a directed graph. But the idea of f sending information in, in both ways, so maybe one neuron consumes information but then sends it back to a neuron that was earlier in the sequence, this idea of that RNN and the, and the power there to, to pass information localized throughout a sub subnet of neurons becomes more powerful. But all of these to be said is there's a lot of different types of architecture in deep learning, and one that has been that one that has been proven to work well with text generation is the recurrent neural network. So if we're going to be making an RNN in Python, what, what, would that be, what would that be? So cool thing, people talk about this all the time. I'm just going to say check out, check out Jake Bonin Plus, his 2017 keynote about why Python's awesome in science. But I'll sum up and say also a lot of other people talk about frameworks. This is not a talk about frameworks. But if you want to dig into, into frameworks, here's some that you can go look at. And then back to our example then with the, with the telenovela notion. So I actually spent time looking around to find scripts for my telenovelas that are available in English. Um, I found them in varying states and varying locations, and I was able to get at least a good enough corpus to include the first three seasons of each of these. So when we are creating our RNN, these are kind of the steps you need to do when you go through. By the way, I do have a Jupyter Notebook linked here to a repository that walks through this. Um, but basically, you need to start first by transforming your data. In this case, we have scripts, we have text. Um, and we need to go ahead and transform it into an input sequence. So that is the samples, timestamps, features. So there's going to be a transformation on your data to match the numerical format of what the RNN accepts. So once you've transformed your data into those input sequences, you have to rescale it to be in a, into a value of 0 and 1. From there, you generate character hot encodings. So a hot encoding kind of looks like that at the top if, if that was an example of, of the letter N. So basically what this allows us to do is to say, for any given character that I see and I put into my neural network, um, what's the probability that that next letter would be this thing? So we, we will generate this one, uh, hot, uh, this one hot encoding, and then we'll go ahead and train our model over many epochs to optimize those weights to allow us to do text generation. So if you were using something like Keras, Again, the APIs are pretty similar. You know, if you're using Theano or, or uh, TensorFlow, you're going to be able to say, "Cool, um, what model do I want? What what f what style do I want?" So first, you pick your model. You you go ahead and you add in the the varying things, and then back to this idea of model fit. So epochs 20, 20 loops. You can kind of think of it as twenty loops. So for the for the next component. Uh, you first set up your model with, with the uh, data transformed with, into character encodings. You run it through your epoch. You basically want to optimize the, the weights relative to the activation function to minimize loss. And once you've kind of found the weight, uh, the weight 
the, the shape of the weights that you want, you can then go ahead and actually, once you've had your model fit, you can then go ahead and use that so you'll see this uh, load weights. After you train with many epochs, you can then go ahead and do that. Go ahead and start predicting. And you can start getting some text generation. So all that to say is, original question, can we generate a telenovela script within RNN? Is that possible? Uh, so if we were going through, again, this loop of going through generating characters, mapping that int back to a character, appending these all together, what kind of text do we get? Well, I did like 20,000 epochs, and I had a very small data set, and I started at least getting lines like this. Do not threaten me. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Whoa, whoa, all right. Hey, look, I. <laughs> so I, I guess that makes sense. Um, but I think the reason that I, w I went through all this is very much just to, s just to say is there, while you start getting the I idea of what a neural network is, you can start actually using them in aggregate together. So maybe not just training on the entire corpus of script, because that really doesn't make sense. Maybe what we can do is an LSTM model for each of the characters who want your script. Maybe we can train on a corpus that's like, hey, these are telenovelas about lost love. These are telenovelas about a scorned lover. I mean, there's there's n variants there. But what would be really interesting to take this to the next step would to be to start kind of piecing these things all together to start seeing if we can make a cohesive script. So TLDR script generation is hard, but generating a learned plot while it may be possible, we have to start. The creativity here is going to be how we think about what it means to use deep learning to be in lieu of like a human actor or like the human writer. And I think that it, with anything, I hope that this talk shows you is that once you kind of got the basics down, it's very much that imagination and that human creativity that's going to allow us to be able to do these kind of artistic endeavors with with things like AI. So that being said, things we could do better. Varying data quality is hard. So to the left, to the right, you notice in the right there's kind of atypical characters. To the left, it's a little bit more structured. You'll notice it even says like woman and my favorite Latin lover narrator. Perfect. I want one of those in my life, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice that there's varying data quality, and I did do some scrubbing, but I could have done more. Um, I'll, and here's the other thing too: is I need more data. So um, as much as I want to go through and like, like scribe these all myself, if you're interested in this, like you should totally add scripts to this link because I'll keep I'll keep working on it. And as we've know. <laughs> As we know, this problem is hard. Our neural networks are in very, very early stage yet. Deep learning is, 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 is early, it's early days yet. And all that to say, you can all do it. You can all pick it up and try. So if you want to be with me doing telenovela stuff, cool. If you are thinking about problems like this, like thwarting face recognition te technology, it's as easy as changing one pixel to actually, uh, to actually shift the labeling of human faces when you're using deep learning. Um, and if you need to keep learning, because I want you to keep learning, I've amassed some resources here, including blogs, articles, videos, online courses. Fast.ai is currently happening, and you can do that remote. And it's pretty awesome. And that's it for me. Thank you, y'all. I'm Lorena. Please reach out to me on social. Talk to me in the hallway if you have more questions. And I'm super happy to go deep, because I know this was a pretty quick 25 minutes. Thank you. Hello. Um, so Lorena will be out in the micro park after the talk yes. for any questions. Yes. Uh, and Nina from Microsoft is running to the stage. Uh, we'll be doing a sponsor talk for just a in just a moment. But before that, uh, here is a uh, token of our thanks, a local Petaluma designed North Bay Python water bottle. Thank uh, you. So everybody, please thank uh, Lorena for a fantastic talk. I think, does she need the dongle?